Good afternoon. I'm uh, Vali Nasser, the Dean of uh, Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody to today's event. I have to say this is a first for me. There's, uh, I think the first time I've uh, introduced a guest and hosted an event that actually I can get kudos from my 13-year-old daughter. <laughs> um, the world is rich with examples of women who lead, innovate, in, and inspire. The Women Who Inspire speaker series endeavors to tell their stories, sharing with our students and community how to best follow in their footsteps. Today's guest will be a tough act to follow, but it is our privilege today to learn from the best, and today's event is no exception. International superstar Gloria Estepan is a Grammy Award-winning singer, actress, songwriter, best-selling author, philanthropist, and humanitarian. Billboard magazine has called her the single most successful Latin crossover artist in music history. Having sold over 100 million records worldwide, Ms. Estepan, along with her husband, Emilio, we're very, we're very pleased to also welcome to SICE today. <laughs> Our successful entrepreneurs owning and operating several businesses, which include a globally recognized music publishing company, seven restaurants, and two hotels. The Estefans are also the first Cuban-American couple to own a minority share in a major NFL franchise, the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> President Obama honored Gloria and Emilio Estefan with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor for their contributions to the United States, to world peace, and to cultural endeavors. She is the recipient of numerous awards and accolades, including seven Grammy Awards, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, an American Music Award for Lifetime Achievement, and Ellis Island Medal of Honor, and also a National Artistic Achievement Award from the United States Congress. Most recently, Ms. Estefan was the first Cuban-American singer-songwriter to receive the Kennedy Center Honors, which spotlights artists who have enriched and shaped cultural life in America. She is the founder of the Gloria Estefan Foundation, whose mission is to support charitable programs for disadvantaged children. Ms. Estefan's work speaks for itself, but it is worth pointing out to our students, who we host her today at the school, <coughs> sorry, at a school that produces more diplomats and aid workers than musicians. She is an example of someone who has used her position and global reach to question the existence of problems and seek out their solutions. Through the arts and influence her work has given her, she has advanced causes that change people's lives. Let her work be a lesson that no matter where you hang your hat and coat each day, that a good that good day's work can be done for worthy causes. Ms. Estepan, thank you for your commitment and work on important humanitarian causes, and we look forward to hearing about your journey today. I would like to also thank Shirin Taher Kaley for making today's event possible. Ambassador Tara Kaley, a veteran diplomat and senior statement on a number of U.S. administrations, is today a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins Science Foreign Policy Institute, and she will be moderating today's conversation. And I would like to now turn your attention to the screen for a video presentation, which will be followed by a conversation between Ms. Estefan and Ambassador Tara Kaley. Please.
Gloria Estefan. Millions have heard her. Millions have seen her. The most successful crossover artist of all time. Gloria Estefan. Worldwide sold out concert tours. Seven-time Grammy Award winner. And the Grammy goes to yes. the Yes, Gloria. Thank you so much. Gloria Estefan. Thank you. Gloria Estefan. 100 million albums sold. 38 number one hits across the Billboard charts. Super Bowl halftime shows. The official closing ceremonies for the Olympic Games. The first time the Cuban National Anthem was performed at the White House. Performed for five presidential administrations. Please welcome Gloria Estefan. Gloria had the privilege of singing at the Vatican in Rome for Pope John Paul II. And most recently at Madison Square Garden in New York for Pope Francis. The Estefans were the first married couple ever to receive the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor bestowed on a civilian, presented by President Barack Obama, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Music Air's Person of the Year, Billboard Music Awards, BMI Songwriter Award, the Sammy Khan Lifetime Achievement Award for Songwriting, and inductee into the Latin Songwriters Hall of Fame. Thank you so much. Gloria wrote global chart-topping hits for Shakira, Jennifer Lopez, and many others. Her voice is heard on an international stage, not only through her music, but also through helping others in times of natural disasters. I am here simply because I could not sit by knowing what is happening right now in Haiti. Get on your feet. And standing strong for those who can't. Stand Donated $1 million to the Paralysis Foundation. And using her influence to defend human rights. Meeting with world leaders. And speaking at the United Nations. It does support increased cooperation. Her music has broken barriers in television and film. The Birdcage. Come on, Gloria. Top Gun, Three Minute of Baby, The Special, Original Sin, Music of the Heart, and currently featured in Ride Along 2 and Alvin and the Chipmunks. And has starred in the motion picture Music of the Heart for Love of Country, Disney's G Force. No lo entiendes. Quiero que Blaster se interese en mí. The television series Glee. I care that my baby's happy. And the Chris Isaac Show. How much I love you. America Dead is the next. Resist if you dare, said the New York Times. It's a hit, the Chicago Tribune. A star is born, deadline. Renews faith in the American dream, the Huffington Post. A musical sensation based on her and husband Emilio's life and career, On Your Feet, is now a bona fide hit on Broadway. Musical icon. Role model. 
actor. New York Times best-selling author. Entrepreneur. Humanitarian. International superstar. Gloria Estefan. Now you know everything, we don't have to talk. <laughs> there's seats up here because my, my hubby chickened out and is sitting in the back, so there's four open Sarah? seats if somebody wants to come up here. Do you prefer a side? Uh, I think they prefer the honored guest to be on oh. that side. So this way I'm sa safer to the, I mean, I'm exposed to the okay. glass in case it starts to fly. <laughs> <laughs> Which we don't think it will. I know I don't need to remind you, but I will nonetheless. Please put your iPhones and other equipment on silence. Uh, we have a lot of fun stuff to do today, and we don't want ringtones to interfere with our fun. And I know I have several Gloria Stefan fans who will tackle you if your phones go off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think we... We don't... Uh, Unless the ringer is conga, then you're cool. <laughs> well, um, the, the dean already gave you, you the, her biography and gave you, Gloria, a sense of what we're trying to do here. But I want to add to the welcome from the dean uh, to say thank you for being part of our Women Who Inspire series. It's a small group of women. We bring two a year to size. And I think the importance of somebody like yourself, who's bridged across so many divides, is so, so important. Not just today, because you know people talk about the divisions of today, but just, I think, at any given moment in any nation's history. So it, I, I feel very privileged to welcome you here and to be working with you again. Again, yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank I, you I so think much. before we go, um, into the conversation on her uh, the rest of her life, and you saw just some vignettes of it in the wonderful video, and thank you for, to, for, to your wonderful team for helping You're us on. get that. But I've worked uh, hard. But, yeah, <laughs> and you worked hard and you worked constantly. So, you know, it, it's just, and of course, it's obvious that you got results. So it's, it's it, important every, in all of that. Every moment. But I was so happy to see in there a short of you behind the United States plaque, because I met Gloria Stefan in 1991 when she came up to be one of the U.S. De uh, public delegates to the U.N. General Assembly, nominated uh, by uh, President George H.W. Bush. And when she came up for that three-month period, of course, I mean, she was already in 1990 very famous. And I was telling the, the story earlier that suddenly I was, you know, Tom Pickering was the senior most American ambassador. We had three at the time. And I was a junior most. So suddenly I, I sort of saw people thinking, now why is, because Gloria had said she wanted to work on human rights, which is a very tough issue. And therefore the junior ambassador always got that issue. Uh, and so suddenly it became a very popular thing because that's what she wanted to work on. And I have never, I mean, I have worked with the, with the best in, in my business and elsewhere, but I've never seen anybody work harder than, than you did and this. bring, you know, substance and personal experience and commitment. Apart from which, the pic, you can imagine she's sitting in that very formal looking setting. And we had, at that point, 194 countries were members of the United Nations. And I swear, 190 of them, each time she appeared, the senior ambassadors would line up with photographs, the day's programs. Diplomacy. The, men, the menu from the restaurant, whatever. <laughs> and she signed them day after day, day after day, smile on her face, and we collected in the votes. So yes. thank you for, on behalf of the American There's people. There's many ways to do so. So, you know, with, with, 
you, there are so many stories and there's so many things when, when I, could, I could actually spend time and I know that it would resonate with the audience. Um, but I want to sort of ask you a, more, a step back question, which actually comes from a younger generation person than myself. But I think it, it sort of is a good sort of starting point for us that as you look at your career, and the career has spanned not just time, but different kinds of outreach and commitments and, and achievements. How, what do you see as being very different from today, from the earlier part of your career, but even as it evolved? And what do you see as being more or less the same? That's a very good question. What is different? Uh, I have the luxury to choose every moment and what I do. Because when you start your career, as you all well know, there are many things that simply have to be done. You have to have your education, you have to graduate, you have to find your passion, you have to work towards it, get jobs, survive, do things to further your idea, you, the way you want to live and the things that you want to achieve. I am very fortunate that at this point, even though every choice I made along the way, I always looked far into the future because we had many opportunities Early on in the 80s in Miami, we were gigging, as, they, as musicians call it. We played a lot of gigs all over Miami, and we were making a lot of money. So at the time that Emilio and I took the risk of trying to record our original music, which started in 1976, our first album that we did, then um, we knew there was going to come a point where we would have to stop the gigs so that we would be able to move onward and forward. But every time we made a decision, we always thought of our family, obviously our son at the time, um, where it would take us, how it would represent our culture as Cuban Americans, because the minute you start getting any kind of fame or people or recognition, then all of a sudden you carry the weight of your people, your gender, a lot of things come along with it. Fortunately for me, it wasn't a chore because our lives were very, you know, family oriented and we really never did anything that wouldn't make our parents proud. Mm -hmm. So our parents were our gauge and then later our people and then the fans always forefront in my mind. But uh, sometimes it's harder to choose not to do things and I, what I wanted and I told Emilio early on, I said, I'm going to work really hard so one day I don't have to work so hard. Well, it, it hasn't turned out exactly that because I'm probably <laughs> working harder than ever, but I am working in things that I choose to put my energy in, uh, whereas before I may have had to, okay, you write the music, you go into the studio, you record the album, then you have to go on tour to create the relationships that I have with many of my fans through the years. That's where you cement it. A lot of the times you have to ride on that momentum. And I know that early in all your careers and everybody's career, there's a lot of moments where you just have to do it because you have to and it's the right thing to do. It may not be what you necessarily want to do at that moment. Mm -hmm. So I think that the blessing, especially for women, I've loved every decade, by the way, I've loved everyone, although this number was a little hard to swallow, I gotta tell you, my last birthday. <laughs> yeah, you can look it up, 60. <laughs> I, I'm going, how did I get here so fast? <laughs> how did that happen? I have loved every step of the way, but what I particularly love about 50s and 60 and what's to come is that you have, you're kind of cooked. You, know, you're, you have a world of experience in so many things, especially yourself. Um, if you're a person that is aware and becomes self-aware and continuously learns, this is an age where I can give back even more, although I've tried to do it every step of the way. Uh, but I can choose to focus on those things. Um, I was able to focus on being there for my mother at the end of her life, being there for my grandson at the beginning of his, and taking time that before may have been tougher to carve out because mm. you had to make choices. So the good thing is I took my family with me, so that's one choice that I didn't have to make, and I wouldn't have made any other way. Because I told Emilio again early on, 
we either all go or I'm not going because I didn't want to miss my son's life. I didn't want to be separated from him. So I think that the freedom of being able to choose and having made a life where Emilio and I have made it possible to make the choices, you know, that continue to make us happy. And but other than that, I'm I'm kind of the same person. I I I was telling Shirin before. I studied at the University of Miami. I had majors in communications and psychology. I was going to be a doctor. I was going to be a psychologist, French minor. So by the time I got accepted to the UM clinical psych school, there were only 12 chairs, and I had pretty much decided that maybe that wasn't a good idea for me. I had a tough time divorcing myself emotionally from the social work that I was doing. Now I could probably do it. But at the time, I was, it hurt a lot. And I thought, you know, what I really would love to get into is uh, diplomacy. So I had been accepted to Sorbonne in, in Paris to study international law and diplomacy. But then I met Emilio. <laughs> there he is. Yes. <laughs> we will be married 40 years this September. Yes. <laughs> Emilio, where's Emilio? Say hi, babe. Say hi. There Yay. he is. <laughs> And uh, funny enough, I was not thinking of marriage by any means. I didn't think I would get married. And if I did, I thought it'd be in my late 30s. And boom, the day after I turned 21, <laughs> I married Emilio Stefan. And I am, I've never, ever had to doubt it for one moment. And we are very different, but we make a great team. And that is very important, and it has been very important in my life to be able to balance. He's been... Nothing but supportive. He's one of the most motivational people I know. He told me I could do it. I would tell him he could do it. And together we were our best cheerleaders. When people would tell us this is not going to work, you're too American for the Latins, you're too Latin for the Americans. And we go, that's who we are. Hello, thank you very much. This is, this is who we want to be. And we're not going to change our sound or our name or, or you know, try to match expectations of what the market wanted and as a matter of fact that's the reason we had success because mm -hmm. we didn't do that so uh it's i think it's been i don't think i ever would have i wouldn't be where i am had i not met him because i'm a very contented person so he kind of pulled me off the couch with my guitar and if we were both like him we'd be dead, dead of heart attacks by now because <laughs> he doesn't stop so we have a great balance and I think that that's the main difference, choice, being able to choose. I think that's a, that's a wonderful um, issue to sort of isolate as an underpinning to your own life and success and things done. Uh, it's a lesson for many of us, and some of us are in, in, the, in this room are much younger, of how, in a sense, being true to yourself I mean, you have had the luxury of being true to yourself, but you also had the choice made early always on, which made it one way or the other. It's always a choice, and, and some of them are hard, and some of the choices. Right, right, and, and particularly if you also carry, I mean, as the dean talked about your long and illustrious career, there are a lot of firsts there. And being a first is not easy business, uh, and you've sort of handled that part of it with the with, I think, I mean, I saw it in action in diplomacy, which I did not know at the time that this was something you had planned to do. Yes. Clearly, they missed you in diplomacy because still, <laughs> but there's never, it's never I too make, late. I do diplomacy in a different way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But Music, I, the nice part. Yeah, the the nicer part. part. Yes. But I, I understand that because, you know, I, I, just to digress for a second, this memoir that I was urged to write, anyway, it's just coming out. And I focus a little bit on what the, the burdens of being a first, because I was told I was the first Muslim ambassador in American history, so you know, then, or the first woman in the Oval Office saying X, Y, and Z. And you think, oh my God, so if I fail, I not only go down, I take all of two billion Muslims down with me, or, Pressure. or all the women down with me. And, and I remember when I went up for my ambassadorship just before we met, I, a very well meaning, very, very well known correspondent said to me, she pulled me aside and she said, I need to give you advice before you go for the, to the Senate tomorrow morning to you know, get your, appear before the Senate for your confirmation. And I said, what's that? She said, go buy a skirt tonight. 
So I said, what? You know, I said, I've studied the UN and my PhD thesis was on it. She said, no, that's not going to matter. You don't look American. So I said, you mean if I put on a skirt, I'm going to look American? Are you kidding me? I'm not so. But, when, but that moment before I went into the Senate hearing room, I thought, gee, this is all going to ride on my not having worn a skirt. So, you know, it, it sounds silly now, but if it's you... It's not silly. It's important sort of, issues at the time. And even think, what to, when I write a song, for example, I, music was such an inspiration to me and was so incredibly powerful as a healing force in my own life that when I got the opportunity to write my music and have people listen to it, I knew, I was very clear on the opportunity that I had both to communicate mm -hmm. through that song and to try to move someone or inspire them. So sometimes when I'm writing a song, of course, they come in different ways. There's inspiration, these songs that just come through me, it feels like. They come from somewhere, There's, they're supposed to be here. And then there's the craft of songwriting. As a good diplomat should be, I always try to make sure that the song itself broadens and reaches as many different people rather than exclusionary. Sometimes it's in a pronoun or in a he or a she to exclude it so that for whatever experience that the person is listening to the song, it could be a part of their own life without suddenly, oh, that's not me in this part of the song. If it, you know, uh, some, some songs that I've written, like for my husband that we, we wrote together, uh, Con los años que me quedan, but if you notice a lot of my songs, they are purpose, purposely broad in who they speak to. I've done that from the beginning. And it's funny because recently they invited me to, bless you, they invited me to be a part of a, of a project where they reimagined uh, the songs by changing the he to she or she to he or whatever. And I said, they don't have to change any of my, any of my songs. Most of them don't have either pronoun in it or you know, I, either moniker because I purposely wanted as many people to identify with the song as possible. So even in the tiniest things in life, we can be very diplomatic. I also, another thing that was for me tough, believe it or not, I don't like to be the center of attention, all right? <laughs> it is not my nature. I used to be not shy in a way one-on-one, -on -one, but I just don't like everybody focusing on me or didn't. I'm used to that now, it's perfectly natural. But when I started getting, again, a little bit of you know, recognition in the band, I realized that I had to push myself to be the, f the one that made the first connection or mm -hmm. took the first step with someone. Because if not, it would come off as, oh, she thinks she's better than me or she thinks mm -hmm. she's all that or whatever, which is the last thing I wanted them to feel from me. So I had to literally uh, get my spirit up to be able to make the first move. And when I was in college, since I had joined the band, I go, okay, how can I make myself better on stage? I took public speaking because I, you know, they, pushed, they pushed you mm. to certain places that I never would have gone. I took modern dance because I knew I was gonna have to move and I wanted to feel more comfortable. I tried to find tools that would help me not doesn't have to be specifically about what you're doing, but that as a human being would make it easier or better or let me have more success at what I was trying to achieve in the band or in whatever it was that I was doing. So there are so many little things that can help us all mm -hmm. grow. And the idea is to push yourself beyond the boundaries of your comfort zone. When I met you there, imagine, I was so excited President Bush asked me to be the public delegate, and I thought, is this going to be one of those honorary things? Because if it is, I don't, I'm not interested. If I can get in there and really work, I would love to do it. But I go into the United Nations, I meet you, these are career diplomats, and you have to believe that what you have to offer is worthwhile. You have to believe in yourself, you have to believe that you've got a point of view, that you've got an, uh, an opinion that is gonna matter. And the one thing that I can tell you, especially for everybody that's young in this room, as a kid I always thought that the people in power, the people that were in, in authority positions knew what they were doing. <laughs> Too much laughter. <laughs> Everybody's flying by the seat of their pants, I hate to tell you, pretty much. 
even That's if on you, a good day. Yes. <laughs> so even if you prepare yeah. to the maximum of any, you know, as high as you can get, still a lot of things are going to be just, what do I do now? It's going to be up to you to make those decisions and to forge ahead and feel like what you have to offer is important. And don't think that someone knows better than you. They don't necessarily. Most of the time they don't at all. But that, it took me a lot because, you know, my dad was a police officer in Cuba. I have a thing about uniforms and authority figures, you know, the military police that was on the bases. So I already have that thing. If I'm driving and a cop pulls up next to me, it's like, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> I do something wrong. That's how it was because it was, you know, I like to follow rules. And I had to learn to break them. That's the bottom line. You learn the rules in music. You learn the rules. And if you don't break them, you're not going to do anything new. So oh. that was another thing that I kind of had to, kind of had to learn. And since I didn't study music, my musicians and my band actually said, that it was very useful and it was great. And the reason that I did songs that were different and unique was because I didn't follow those rules, yet they worked. And I know that it, had I learned those rules, maybe I wouldn't have written half the things that I did because they came from the heart, the spirit, and a very natural place. So I'm glad that I didn't study music at the time. <laughs> no, that's, uh, but you know, you, you uh, so many uh, of the, comments about you, talk about your unique role as a crossover with you and Emilia, what you achieved in, in terms of uh, successful Latin crossover music and recognized globally for that. Um, was that just a natural expression of yourselves? Or did you, I mean, did it just, you woke up in the morning and said, we'll just be ourselves and this will just flow? It's not even about that because when I joined his band, it was for fun. I joined at 17. We met by chance. Um, I played in the folk masses with my guitar. I went to an all-girl Catholic high school, which makes me a bit irreverent, so sorry if <laughs> anyone's hardcore religious, but I, I admire and I respect every single religion. I think that there, every path is an important one. I don't like dogma, so it's a little tough to be Catholic if you don't like dogma. <laughs> but I played in the folk masses, and then there was a friend of mine that was in the brother school that played with us. His father worked at Bacardi, Emilio worked at Bacardi. He wanted to put together a band one night for our uh, parents that had gone to a retreat and were coming back. It was going to be a one night thing. So he puts the band together. And his dad goes, I'm going to call this guy. You know, he's, been, he's got a band, Miami Latin Boys. They've been playing around town. He just played for the mayor. They're doing really well. He can give you some pointers. So I was sitting on the floor. I'll never forget this. 17, just graduated from uh, Our Lady of Lourdes Academy. And in walks this guy in shorts, super short shorts, <laughs> that I'm sure his mother made from a couch or something of this nature, because it was upholstered more like than material, and his accordion. So of course, from my angle, he looked naked. He was like, <laughs> and he had great legs. And I was watching his hands, because I'm fascinated by people's hands, and especially when they're playing an instrument, whatever. So he heard us play, he gave us pointers, he left. A couple months after that, my mom drags me to a wedding of one of my dad's army buddies, his daughter, who I grew up with in South Carolina. And uh, I walk into the room and I see this band playing and there's, everybody's having a blast. This charismatic young man is playing Do the Hustle on the accordion. <laughs> so I go, well, he's brave. <laughs> but it was great, it was fantastic. Everybody was having a wonderful time and we run into each other in a doorway and, and he goes, oh, you, you're that girl that I saw. I go, yeah, you're that boy. He goes, hey, you want to sit in with the band? Of course, I'm freaking out, but my mom, yes, do it. Later, she was not happy that she had done that. <laughs> and it only took him 12 years to win her over, but well, that's a whole other story. But anyway, so when I, he, that night, I got a standing ovation because these people have been listening to me sing since I'm a kid with my guitar. He didn't know that, so that was good. He asked me that night, you want to join the band? I go, I can't. 
I'm starting the university in September. I already have two jobs. I was working at co the college work study program since French was my minor. I took a county test and I was working as an interpreter for French, English, and Spanish at the Immigration and Customs in Miami. Six days a week, full load of um, school between eight and 12 noon, one to nine at night, six days a week. I was working at the airport and I was teaching community school guitar at uh, a junior high two nights a week between 9.30 and 11.30. So then this guy says, you want to join my band? I'm going like, Ugh. well, I knew my mom was not going to be a happy camper. And I said, no, I can't. You know, I can't. There's no way. And so he left. We left. Two weeks later, he tracks me down through the, mari the marriage people. And he, he says, look, I really think that this would be a great thing for you. We do it as a hobby. I work full time. We rehearse a couple nights a week. I'll work around your schedule. We just perform on the weekends. So I really wanted to do it very badly. So I said to my mom, I'm not going to quit school, but I really want to do this. So we went, my mom, my grandma, my sister, and me, <laughs> to his apartment where he lived with his parents. And crammed into that tiny space was a nine-piece band. And in the condo where they lived, everybody would have a party every time they rehearsed because they had no choice. <laughs> like, you gotta listen, you gotta do it. So when I joined the band, the first things that I sang were old Cuban, like legit antique songs. I knew them because I used to sing them for my grandma and learn songs for her. So I knew all those songs. They were up-tempo. What I played on my guitar was mostly ballads. So I learned all that music. Uh, when I joined the band. And then I told him, hey, you know, we can do ballads. Disco was starting. Mm. So I go, I think we can really expand the reach of the band if we, you know, do this kind of thing. So then we, he started, the band started learning the songs that I loved, ballads and things of this nature. Long story short, we, the, it took off because we had a very unique sound, but doing pe other people's music. So he says to me, I want to go into, I want to do original stuff from the band. Have you ever written music? I go, well, I've written a lot of parodies. That comes easy to me, usually dirty, and I can't sing them live. <laughs> I go, I do poetry. I think I could do it. And you're still talking only weekends? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, no, gig band. Although as we got more popular, you know, especially at Christmas time, sometimes we'd have three gigs in one day. We'd do a lunch thing, we'd do a happy hour, and then we'd do a gig at, at night. Okay, so, so yeah, no, so we were working hard. He said, I'd, I'd love to do that. So I, the, I wrote a song. He loved it. We went into the studio. We only had enough money to do two days worth of studio. So we recorded a whole album in two days. Wow. Um, a guy that signed, we signed to a small local label that somebody that was helping him, uh, you know, that had another band hooked us up with this guy. He signed to RCA in Latin America. All of a sudden, our first single, Renacer, it was called, um, 1976, it takes off all over Latin America, and we are huge there all of a sudden. So we'd go and play a 50,000-seat stadium and come back and do a wedding with 200 people in Miami. <laughs> that teaches you very clearly what fame is about, and it's given to you, and it could be easily taken away. So as we started doing our original music, both of us had this vocabulary from both worlds. Uh. I kept the music alive from Cuba for my mother and my grandmother. He played, he had a band in Cuba when he was eight that he put together. His, he used to play old Cuban standards and then he, they started learning the Anglo stuff for me. So when we started writing our own material and our own music, it was very natural for us to say, hey, this works here. This rhythm works here. Percussion was huge. He had a horn section. So that experience of Miami Latin boys and all that really shaped what our music became. And that's who we were. The first album that we did on our own was half in English, half in Spanish. A little too early for that. <laughs> Second album, the same. We ended up having to leave that you know, that um, record company because they didn't pay us one cent. And mm. we go, okay, you pay your dues, but we want to do this 
the right way. We op I said to him, let's, I think we need to start our own publishing company so that we can control our songs because the guy had signed us to his publishing and had never paid us. And so we got the, on the third album, we got the song on the radio. Disco CBS, which ultimately became Sony, came to us to sign us, but we were trying to get ourselves untangled from that first guy. And they said, no, unless you get a release from him, we can't sign you. So then that's one of those decisions mm -hmm. that you have to make in life. The guy said, I will release you if you release me from having to pay you anything on your first two albums. <clears throat> and so Emilio and I talked it over and we go, look, we're going to keep writing songs. This guy's got us right now by, you know, timing is everything. What if we continue this fight and we lose this over here? So we said, okay, let's forget about that. It served a purpose. It made us very famous in Latin America, so we could still tour and we could bank on that success. Let's move forward. We released, the, released him from his commitment. He released us. We signed with Disco CBS. And then 35 years later, he came to us, broke, and sold us back all our songs from the first two albums for $25,000. So. <laughs> Our publishing company owns every one of the songs we've ever written. But that's one of those things where you have to make a decision as to what value does something have. So as, as long as we were with Disco CBS, they come to us and say, we want you to record more in Spanish because we're more about Spanish. We said, yes, but we have a contractual, we put it in our contract. When we signed with them already, having learned mm. what we learned, we said, we're bilingual. We'll do what you want right now, but we need to have the contractual right to be able to record in English if we so choose. And we need to have creative control over the stu what we put in the studio. You can't tell us what to write or what to record. We will work with you and try to do what you want for your market. So then we did. We did four albums with them, did what they asked. We did. Most of it in Spanish, actually all of it. We got a lot of hits all over Latin America and, it, and in the Latin radio stations in the U.S. Then, on our seventh career album, the fourth album with them, we snuck a song on the album in English called Dr. Beat. So we snuck that one and one called I Need a Man. We, we convinced them that since it was in English and it didn't matter, can we put it on the B side of the single, please? They go, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Okay. Then we talked to this guy that was an amazing remixer and said, we don't have any money. We've got some studio time. We want you to do a 12-inch mix because at that time the, the clubs were huge. We'll pay you a percentage on the, backs, on the back end, meaning when we sell them. And he said, absolutely, because he was a huge fan and wanted to do it. We took the record, Emilio and I, to all the record pools all over Miami and in Puerto Rico. The song got exported to, to Europe and they were looking to sign us over there. Epic comes and says, we want to sign you. The song went to number one in Holland and England and the hmm. Spanish language album that it was on went to the top 10 because over there. Because of that song. Because of that song. Wow. So all of a sudden the Latin company was making millions in sales. So we went back into the studio and finished the whole album in English. We got the thing on the charts. It came back to the United States via the back door of Europe. And we kind of made it happen, despite the fact that our contract was in Spanish. So then we said to them, OK, we, we want you to let us record an album all in English. Now, at the time, the, the epic uh, executive, and if any of you have seen the show, the executive in the show is kind of like a composite character of many people that told us no. And the guy said to us, oh, no, no, no. They said to Emilio, you got to lose the horns. You got to get rid of the percussion. You got to change your name if you want to compete in the US market because you're not going to be able to do it. Our, the amount of money they gave us was minimal compared to American artists. So Emilio and I put all our life savings into the album that we talked them into letting us record. And that album had 
conga, bad boy, words get in the way, like a bunch of different songs that then took us to a whole other level. So it was important for us to maintain who we were, who we were culturally, who we were musically. We kept telling them, we don't want to succeed on something that is not us. We want to be able to do what we do. And if we fail, it doesn't matter. But if we succeed, you're going to be doing this the rest of your life. So you better like it, and it better be who you are. So that's how that whole sound that's, got shaped. And interesting, because when I first heard about your publishing, because you know, I, from academia, I'm thinking publishing. I wonder what led them to publishing. But this, is, this was sort of at the heart of your mission as artists. The, you're having your own Owning, control over, yes. over... You know, so even now, someone will offer a lot of money to use your song to sell something. And it's tempting because especially nowadays, music, I mean, there's no more CD sales. The musicians are having a really tough time surviving. And unless you're a touring artist that can, that's already been famous and can make a lot of money live, we used to sell albums and it was an amazing, you'd sell two million, we would ship two million albums on the first week of, mm. of a release. Now, if you sell two million albums worldwide with a number one hit, you're lucky. And that's, that's gonna go by the wayside too, because now it's an all streaming world. It's, that's where we're going. And we've, thankfully, we diversified, because I also told Emilia, you know, women, we have a shorter shelf life in this business. It's just how it is. And he, being a businessman as well, we didn't want to have all our eggs in one basket. He also didn't want me to have the pressure of being the one that always has to, you know, maintain uh, and work. So he worked with a lot of different artists. He won, he's got way more Grammys than me. He's got like 19 Grammys, I have seven. He's worked with many different artists, which took the pressure off of me. So we've always had that teamwork and we're always thinking ahead and always thinking, you know, these songs are like your children. You want to be able to pick the, make the right choices for them. And, you know, if someone buys your publishing, you lose control of what they can do with your song. And uh, that we didn't want. So. so is your publishing company exclusively just for Emilio and your creative work? Oh, or we've signed a lot of other okay. artists on our publishing. And uh, at one point we had like 20, 25 artists writing for him because he was doing a lot of different artists. And uh -huh. you know, there's no way I can write that much. Or, and I've pretty much written a lot of our, a lot of our songs. And you know, I'm not that prolific to be able to write for me and everybody he was working for. So he also likes to expand and grow and, and give other people an opportunity because we also mm -hmm. set that publishing company up so that people, other artists wouldn't suffer the fate that we did at the beginning where we weren't getting paid. And we wanted to make sure that the artists that signed with us got paid and, and made a living from, from their music. So it's, it's in a sense also part of your mentoring of yes. up and coming talent, which exactly. you do in so many different Yes, areas. and it, we, we were very happy to, to say to someone like Shakira, yes, you can do this. Because she came to Emilio um, to have him produce an album in Spanish, which he did for her. But we were convinced that that sound could cross over and we had to do a lot of work to, to have the record company believe it and to have even Shakira believe it because she's an amazing artist but she hadn't written in English before. So I kind of took her down that path and then immediately she, like she's incredible. So she found, okay, yes, I can do this. So for us, it was really important too, to broaden the Latin sound worldwide that we pushed the door open a little more because we weren't the first. I mean, for me, Jose Feliciano, Carlos Santana, even Desi Arnaz back in the 50s, it's true. Yeah. I mean, in the 50s, America was watching on television, Spanish being spoken, songs being done in Spanish, laughing at the banter between Ricky and Lucy, which we kind of have the same thing, but he's more like Lucy because he's very <laughs> absent-minded. So when we were able to push that door open a little more, we really wanted to make it easier for other artists, like Ricky Martin. He's the one that got Ricky Martin on the Grammys where he exploded after that performance and uh, he worked with Mark Anthony, he's worked with John Cicada, who went on the road with me as one of my background singers, and I was a huge fan. And while I was changing, we put him on to sing a song that Emilio was producing and getting 
like laying the groundwork for him to then come and boom, he had an amazing, because he was great, wonderful artist. So it was really fulfilling for us. And it always is to help another artist to, and he's worked with a lot of very sexy women, let me say. <laughs> You have to be pretty sure of your love when he's in the studio till three, four, five in the morning with J-Lo, Madonna, <laughs> Shakira. <laughs> so, yes. He looks unmoved. I think you're, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> but, I trust him. He's good. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's the power of example again that we talk about and, and the, the willingness and the ability to sort of have that bigness of spirit to sort of do that for other people. Uh, in any field, not just uh, for artists, but in any field, basically. But we love that, and, and, and I it's, think it's very important to do. And that you have done it, and done it as a team, makes it kind of doubly, because then it's, you know, with the broader background of each of you, it, it, it certainly... Because, I mean, I, I remember thinking about uh, the various other aspects of ways in which you've decided to go, uh, to broaden your reach. I mean, I'm thinking of that wonderful restaurant in South Beach, and, and then I, I hadn't focused on the Miami Dolphins, and so this was just part of the... Could you please focus on the Miami Dolphins? <laughs> Do you have any advice for them? <laughs> no, look, Emilio and I both are people that, we want to do what we can do. And to me, I grew up watching two amazing women. My grandfather was very ill, so my grandmother was the one that really took the reins and ran the business and started her own business when she came from Cuba at 57 years old, was able to buy her own home. Then my mother, my dad got ill, so my mother went back, got her, her she had a PhD in education from Cuba. She got her teaching credentials uh, revalidated. I did a lot of her papers. <laughs> Actually, I made quite a bit of money making, doing papers for her friends. Mm -hmm. I could hardly speak English. Yeah. If we, I mean, so I kind of had an education degree too. <laughs> but uh, hey, I had to make ends meet. I needed some money, you know, like. A, but no, I, I saw two women that did it all. It was never a question to me. There was no glass ceiling in my brain because all I saw were women doing everything and going through hard times and taking care of their families and still having careers and jobs and raising my sister and I, sending me to prep school, both of us, so that I was able to clip the first year of college and save that because I got 30 credits off the bat. So I started as a sophomore and graduated in three years, which saved me a lot of money. It was a little bit of a national direct student loan that Emilio and I paid off later. But my mom couldn't afford the University of Miami. It was very expensive. So I wanted a very good education. And I think if we show by example to our young people that everything is possible. You, yes, you have to choose. You have to make choices. But mm -hmm. I, I really always wanted to do as much as I could do in, in a way that didn't take away from my family or you know, my son, my, my husband, all of us as, as, a, as a group. And it was very important that I had those strong women to show me that, you know, yes, of course you can do this, and you're going to. And my grandmother, since her dream had been to have a, a restaurant, we started buying real estate because I kept telling Emilio, okay, we, we're going to diversify. We need to buy on the beach because I used to go there with my grandfather when I was a kid, and I would see these hotels that had kind of fallen by the wayside, and I knew that one day somebody was going to discover because it was Art Deco, and someone would do it. And it was a good investment to buy something there. And when the money started coming in, I said to him, let's buy something on the beach. And we bought a little apartment building that we fixed up and, and you know, uh, rented to people. Then we bought our home, but only until we could pay it off, because we have that immigrant mentality. You know, We don't want to owe anything, because you think if something happens, oh no. Like, so every step that we took, to diversify. Then when we bought a hotel on South Beach, it had a restaurant in the bottom of it. And we knew a family that, that we used to go to their restaurant. The minute we got off the plane from any trip, they were great. And we said, you want to come with us? We want to do this restaurant. In our hearts, it was to continue to promote our culture through food as well as music, which is a great you know, mm. uh, tie-in. 
So that's when we did Lario's on the Beach. I think that's been open 25 years already. He started talking to the Disney people. I thought he was crazy. Like, that's in Orlando. How are we going to run this thing? He was brilliant. It is our number one restaurant. It's in now switching to Disney Springs. So that's been there quite a while. And we made sure to make investments outside of our field because we knew that things could happen. And we knew that you're at the mercy of your latest hit. Uh, there's a saying, you're only as good as your, as your most recent hit. And that we wanted to have those freedoms to be able to not have to always be on the road or always have to continue to do shows when I, you know, for example, my last tour was in 2004. I announced that it was going to be my last world tour, and it was. I still do things here and there that matter. I still do charity things. I still sing. I'm in the studio right now doing... We took a lot of our hits, and we, we went to Brazil and re-recorded them with the top-notch Brazilian um, musicians. So Conga is now samba. You'll be oh. hearing that probably at the beginning of 19. I rewrote um, Here We Are in Spanish, which had never been done. Um, I wrote a Brazilian hit in both English and Spanish, so it's like a celebration of Brazilian music. And I still love, the studio's my happy place. That's where I feel like my favorite place to be. And mm -hmm. creating things, I've got you know a lot of projects on the burner there, so I continue to do things, but we wanted to be free to make those choices that I talked about at the beginning. And uh, it's been good, you know, it's uh, hard work, but good. Yeah. Well, um, the, I, I wanted to sort of uh, talk a, li a little bit about the uh, presidential, the Medal of Freedom that both you and Emilio, for the first time, I think it was given to a couple. Yes. Uh, ever. And it, it, it surely must have been a very poignant moment. And, and what this meant to you, be given I, immigration is a complicated word in today's America, but nonetheless, I mean, what it meant to you, if, if you'd care to share. Oh my gosh, it was one of the most special moments of our lives. First, to, to be together getting this, and we were going to get, you know, separate medals, but I remember we were in the ante room, uh, and they, President Obama and, and Mrs. Obama were there, and as everyone that was getting the award would file by, you'd go there with your group of people and take a picture with your family members that were invited. I mean, there were some serious people in this lineup. There was Spielberg, uh, Barbara Streisand, um, oh my gosh, the name evades me now, but she was the one that put the man on the moon, the mathematician that Hidden Figures was written about. This woman that was still like in her 90s and there like receiving this honor. So. We take the picture, and we've had the opportunity to meet uh, many presidents and the Obamas several times. And as I'm leaving the room, he goes, Gloria, come back here, come back here. I go, yes, Mr. President. He goes, you know, if Michelle and I were receiving this award, we'd really want to get it together. Would you, would you mind if that happened? I go, mind? Are you kidding me? That would be the biggest honor to receive this with my husband. He says, OK, so when they call you up, you stand there, and then I'm going to call up your husband, too, and we will do it together. And I remember that all I could think of was, you know, Emilio was thinking of his parents, I know, because we've discussed this, and they were both gone. And my mom was still alive at that time, uh, so I knew she was watching. My sister, my only sister, younger, was in the audience, Emilio's niece, people that were very special to us. And it was hard to not break down and cry like a baby there because my father kept coming to my mind because he sacrificed so much for both his countries, for Cuba, where he uh, served as a police officer and then was a political prisoner for two years after Bay of Pigs. He was the head of the tanks division in that kind of misguided uh, Bay of Pigs invasion. Then he joined the US Army and he went to Vietnam, and he came back with Agent Orange poisoning. So he spent, a, you know, uh, he got sick at 34 and died at 47. And I remember him being one of the most idealistic men that I had ever had the pleasure and honor of knowing, and very especially being his daughter. 
And he had made the big sacrifices for freedom and to raise us in a country that is free. And he never took that for granted. So at that moment, all I could think of was him mm -hmm. and his sacrifices. And yeah, I still get <laughs> a knot in my throat there. You more than deserved it, both Emilio and yourselves, but it is always sort of, you know, I'm an immigrant person, so I particularly appreciate that. But we there was somebody there the that, the, yes, that we, was, I think was we recognized. immigrants appreciate yeah. Yeah. the freedoms of this country. Yeah, because you know the darker side. I think far yeah. more than people that have been here for generations that don't think that you could lose it, and that is the farthest thing from the truth. Freedom has to be constantly defended, constantly supported, and constantly, you know, refreshed. And coming from a country where n our parents didn't think that would happen, nobody thought that that could possibly happen in Cuba and like in other countries where mm -hmm. we've seen, you know, a total change. And uh, so, yes, we, we really appreciate it. And for me, the Constitution and the laws of this country, I venerate them. And I venerate the ideology and the things that built this country, very much so. And I will protect it and defend it whenever I can, like my dad did. Yeah. I mean, I haven't gone to war, but <laughs> I've gone to war of words plenty of times. <laughs> I think that's why one gets also you know, committed to the idea that we can't afford to lose it here. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's terribly. The, I, I know there are questions, and I know we're, yes. uh, but I just want, and this probably will come up in a question, that you had this incredibly bad, bad accident. Oh, yeah, not And fun. I think if I, I, that's the stuff we can fill a lot of time over, but in a sense, what took you, it, it was, of course, a medical miracle, but there was a lot more than that involved. Yes. Well, this accident, we were at the peak of our fame. I mean, literally at the peak. I had a sold-out world tour. Um, we were going to be on the road for at least 16 to 18 months. Our record was at the top of the charts. It was selling incredibly well. It had a song called Get On Your Feet On It that got thrown back at me in a million ways. <laughs> <laughs> but we were literally in our best moment. And we had just met President Bush, uh, George H.W., in the White House. We had had a long conversation. Um, and we were on our way to Syracuse, New York, where we had a concert. I was making up this concert tour because I had already had to cancel it because I had a bleed in a vocal cord. They thought that it might be a cancerous tumor. I couldn't speak for two months. It was one of those challenges. And I was so happy to be back on the road making up these, these shows. And we got sandwiched between two 18-wheelers. There was a freak snowstorm in the Poconos on March 20th, 1990. I was laying on the couch uh, in the front of the bus. These tour buses have like a living room and then they have uh, you know, bunk beds where my son was in the back doing homework with his tutor. Emilio was on the phone with his brother who was reading him at that exact moment. The cover of the Miami Herald had a picture of Emilio and I holding a crystal globe that they had just given us for sales of five million of our album. And he was reading to Emilio, Gloria and Emilio Stefan have the world in their hands. This literally happened. And Ooh, wow. that's when we got rear-ended. I got thrown across to the table where we ate. Two vertebrae were pushed in and exploded. I had just opened my eyes because I was taking a nap and I thought, oh, we're here. And then my, my world exploded. I opened my eyes. I was on the floor of the bus, and I couldn't get up. And I thought to myself, oh, here it is. Because it was a big fear in my life because of my dad being in the wheelchair. I was very well-versed well on the workings of the spinal cord and, and all of this because of him. I, I remember reaching back to see if something was coming out from my back. I had a metallic taste in my mouth and the pain was excruciating. So then I go, here it is, my biggest fear. But Emilio and I would always race up the stairs because he's very competitive, let me tell you that right now. 
I taught him racquetball, biggest mistake. I couldn't play with him after that. <laughs> but we would race up the stairs, and I would always, I kind of been a little psychic in my life and had a lot of premonitions of things to come. And you got to listen to that, by the way. Everybody has that. That gut feeling is a very real informational highway for you. So you need to trust those things and not just focus on your five senses because we get a lot of information that way. So when I would go up those steps, I would get the feeling one day I'm not going to be able to do this. And I don't know why I would think that, but then I would think, but it's going to be okay. So when I opened my eyes and I couldn't get up, I thought, here it is, but it's going to be okay. And I clung to that feeling. I felt around, nothing was coming out. I told Emilio, I think I broke my back. Where's the baby? Because our son had been, he had been in the back and thankfully at that moment he got up and he had moved to the bunk, which saved his life. So after Emilio found him, he sat him next to me. He's what made me keep it together. And I used the Lamaze breathing method that I never used because I had to be C-section <laughs> <laughs> to get me through the two hours it took for the ambulance to get to us because there was a seven mile back up, which is why we had stopped and got rear-ended. The driver of the truck that hit us had fallen asleep at the wheel oh. and there was a, a jackknife truck seven miles ahead. So there was, it took a long time for that to happen, to, to get the ambulance. Okay, to make a long story short, I was paralyzed. Um, they flew me to New York because in Scranton there was no way they could operate. And all I could think of through this entire experience was maybe this is the reason that you have fame right now. Because like I said, I don't like being the center of attention. I had to get used to it. I tried to make the best of it and be the best I could be. But fame was never our goal. Music was our goal. Creating music, sharing music, being able to communicate with so many people through our music. And I thought, you know what? Maybe this is the reason that this has happened. I have an opportunity now to, and it took a while, by the way. I wasn't thinking that right at that moment when I was laying on the floor of the bus. But as time passed and I faced different challenges and they operated me, they put me back together, The doctor told me, look, chances are if you work hard enough, you'll walk again. I don't think you'll ever step back on stage and do what you did. Chances are slim that you'll be able to have another child because there was a lot of damage in there. Um, but he said, having said that, his wife had gone through Hodgkin's lymphoma and was in remission. He said, this is what science says. I have seen a lot of things that I cannot explain. And I'm telling you that it's up to you. The outcome of this is up to you. And as I finally made my way back home and couldn't do anything on my own and had to be bathed and set up and, and you know, tilted in bed and Emilio, I couldn't sleep more than 45 minutes and he would be up with me walking me through the house or however, because I couldn't walk so he would have to hold me literally. That's when I started thinking, there's got to be a higher purpose for me going through this because And if there isn't one, I'm going to make one because here's an opportunity. And it wasn't until four to six months after that I was able to put my underwear on by myself. I was able to lift my leg high enough and swing my underwear low enough that I thought, okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back and I'm going to show people that you can get thrown a curveball. You can go through very traumatic experiences, but it's up to you what happens. And I also learned about the power of prayer. Now, mind you, I told you I'm Catholic, so they, they always talked about prayer, prayer, prayer. But it's a very elusive thought. Like, you're talking, you're, you're asking, it's about belief. And it wasn't until I was the recipient of millions of prayers coming at me from all over the world, it was a physical energy. I could feel it. It was like I was plugged into the wall. And it helped me, and I used it, and I would meditate and channel it inward. And all the cards and letters, I still have every one that people sent me. We have a warehouse. It's not in the house. It wouldn't fit. <laughs> But I kept every one of those letters, and I read every one of those letters. And it made me 
it gave me energy, it gave me hope, it gave me just the thought that people would take time out of their own day and go to their place of worship or write me a note or send a good thought my way. That power of connectivity that we have, I felt it firsthand. And I wanted people to realize that you can make a difference in your own life and that people, we all make a difference in each other's lives, whether we see it or not, whether we believe it or not, whether you focus on it or not, every little action that we put out there is going to be felt and it's going to create a ripple effect in some way. So it really changed my life in, in that way. It gave me a renewed energy. I became a lot more expressive in my music and in my life. I didn't waste time. If there was, I told everybody that I loved them every chance I could. I wrote Coming Out of the Dark, that song as a thank you to everyone, everyone that sent those prayers my way. And it continues for me to be one of those songs that every time I sing it, it's like a prayer. Because it was really me thanking everyone. And that was a very, very strong uh, lesson. And uh, it was so important. I wouldn't want to go through that accident again, but I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it. It's helped me a lot. And I think a lot of very wonderful things have come from that And experience. you have a daughter. Yes, and I have a daughter. Yeah, if you tell me I can't do something, mm. <laughs> that's what makes me want to do it the most. Yeah. I took three rounds of fertility, but, and I said, look, I have a son, it's fine, I'll try. But the third time was the charm, and she's a, a miracle, and yeah. the most talented musician of all of us, and has so much to say, and so many wonderful messages for the world through her music. And, uh, you know, it's been, it's been wonderful, and I was able to focus on her and enjoy her childhood, and my son, and now my grandsons as well. So, yeah, so I got back on stage, back in my heels, like they said that I might not wear again, although they're platforms, it's a lot easier. <laughs> and I had the baby. So everything that they told me probably would not happen, happened. And I worked hard, though. I was in rehab six to seven hours a day when I could finally do it. First in the pool, just floating because I couldn't walk. And every day I had to talk myself into, into getting out of bed. It wasn't easy. It was, you know, very, very tough. But I thought, okay, if I don't get up today, and I made very little goals for myself. And whenever anybody asks me, this is what I tell them. I go, you always look at the big picture and you have a plan, but you need to make goals that you can achieve this day. So to me, it was, okay, today I'm going to walk to the door of my room. And then the next day, I'm going to walk out into the hall. I'm going to walk down the stairs. Then I'm going to go to my front door, then outside, then around the island. And it was very much little steps. But each day, I, I really had to talk myself into making those steps because it would have been easier to lay there, you know, and, and feel sorry for myself. I did for 10 days. And then I had to pull myself up by my bootstraps. You cry, you grieve. You get past the trauma of the moment, and then you say, okay, what, what can I focus on that is going to propel me forward in whatever it is I want to do? For me, it was walking again and being independent. That was my first goal. Then when I got that, I go, okay, then maybe I can get back on stage. I knew I could continue to write, and my voice was still there. So being in the studio was very healing. And the first outing I made out of my house was with Emilio to the studio three months after the accident because I felt so bad for him because he's, he's claustrophobic. So just to be stuck at home with me for three months was miraculous. And he didn't leave my side. And I went, he, he told me, you know, in my, in my pocket today, I found this paper that I wrote the day that we were being transported to New York from Scranton. It was a gray day and we were in two separate helicopters and a, a ray of light kept hitting him in the eye. And he took a piece of paper and he wrote the words coming out of the dark. And mind you, English is not his first language. I, I wonder about that, babe. Why didn't you write that in Spanish? But anyway, <laughs> I'm thinking about it. It's inspiration. That's why it yeah. came to him. He wrote down the thing. He put it in his pants pocket. He forgot about it. And trying to find fish out a quarter to put the toll, one day as he's on the highway, he finds his paper all washed and with faded letters. And he comes to me and he says, he called John Sakata and he said, hey, come to the studio. I want to write 
this song, and he knew that music was always healing to me. So he's, he comes to me, you know, sheepishly, knowing what he was going to ask me. Hey, look at this. I have this, this title, and I want to write it. Would you want to come with me to the studio? And I said, you know what? Of course I'm going to come with you, because I felt horrible that I had kept him home for three months. So I went for him. And I sat in the room. John Sakara sang me the melody of those words, of those four words. I don't know, however many words. <laughs> and it all just wow. flooded through me. We wrote that song in 15 minutes. Oh. And we recorded it like the demo right there, right away. And because the minute I heard his voice singing that melody, it just, it was, you know, for me, that's what inspiration is. And you pray for it as an artist, but when you get it, it's magical. And uh, you have to try to make it happen even when you don't have it. That's where the craft comes in. But when you marry those two things, it's, it's magical and people can feel it. So it was, again, music was a healing force in my life once again. It was, it was amazing. Well, I, you know, we can, reflections on a life lived fully can be even longer than I've made it. I, we do have time for a few questions. Please keep it brief. Uh, okay, if, and could we, please wait till you uh, get a microphone. Uh, Do I get to pick who, who or, or are you picking? No, you can pick. Okay, Just, that flag has got a, <laughs> you, she's got a flag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You absolutely Hi, um, you are one of the idols of my life, actually. Um, <laughs> my name is Lauren Paulette, and I'm a freshman at the Johns Hopkins Homewood campus. I actually came all the way from Baltimore to come see you. Thank you. Uh, I have spent the last 19 years of my life living in Miami. I'm also Cuban American. Yes. Go cool. figure. <laughs> um, but one of the hardest things that I've had to deal with in transitioning into college is being severed from my culture and. I've had a lot of trouble balancing the two facets of my identity, being Cuban and being American. And I know that you have basically preserved your identity through your music. What advice do you have for me and for other young Cuban women who are looking to work in the field and also preserve their culture? Well, you're never going to lose your culture, all right? Nobody can take that away from you. My mother kept it alive for us because she thought we were going back. So. Nothing that you could possibly do is going to erase anything or make anything lesser. There are moments where you have to focus on certain things, all right? And I know that in many universities, I've been to Princeton and Harvard and whatnot, they have Cuban clubs that are started by certain members that want to keep and share that culture or whatever culture. For us, it's the Cuban American or the Cuban, but. Um, for other people, maybe whatever they had. So if you were really missing that, I would say start something that's going to keep it alive or even just, you know, uh, getting together once in a while or sharing your food or whatever. But throw yourself into the university experience right now. We are lucky enough to have two cultures. That's a wonderful thing. All right. It's beautiful. My grandson speaks four languages. His mother is Italian. I'm learning Italian now so I can speak Italian with my grandson. He speaks Spanish, English and some French, because her mother speaks French too, so we keep that alive. The more that we can share our culture with the world, the more you keep it alive for yourself. But don't be afraid of being away from the center of your core. This is your years to thrive and learn and do new things and learn other, learn both your American culture and so many other cultures that you're going to be sharing with in, in school. But you will never lose that. It's, it's in your power to keep alive. And by listening to your music and having care packages sent from home, <laughs> of food that you can share, you know, there's a lot of things. Plus, I'm sure you can find some places. Do some research. I guarantee you there's some Cuban everywhere. I rented a camel in Morocco from a Cuban. So <laughs> we are everywhere. We're all over. So look around. You're going to find it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, right here. It's coming. Yeah. Right, just one second. I'm going to let you pick the next one, Shireen, because I'm... Okay. I'll definitely bring a flag next time. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Ambassador Shireen, thank you for hosting this. It has felt like a Saturday afternoon at home just listening to wonderful stories. 
Gloria, you're an amazing woman, and thank you for giving thank us this so gift. I, I, remember, uh, I remember you from uh, the UN General Assembly that uh, Ambassador Shirin was talking about, and I agree with everything she said. I have two questions. If you, who would be two or three or one, you know, let's say world leader or world personality that you haven't met, that you would like to have a sit down like this, you know, just to talk with him or her? And the second question. Sorry. Can they be dead? <laughs> sure, they, they can be dead. Uh, in the second no question, well, actually, the second question is about somebody who's dead. If you had had the opportunity, if you had had the opportunity to have a sit down like this, maybe even, let's say, in private, with Fidel Castro, what would you have asked him? What would you have wanted to hear Ooh, from him? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> and keep my hands from around his throat. <laughs> I'm not violent. I'm not violent. Look. <laughs> On occasion. All right, like I said before, to me it is very important to maintain my culture, but also to maintain um, my beliefs. And if I thought for one second that there was anything that I could have said to Fidel Castro that would have changed his mind, I would have had that conversation. But that was an impossibility, as we can see, based on history, nothing changed. And as a matter of fact, even now, even with Raul stepping down, the children are in position, they're still controlling everything. So it is very difficult, and it would be very tough. Not to mention, it would have killed my mother way ahead of time <laughs> than that she died. But if I knew that something that I could possibly say would make life better for the Cuban people, I would have done so. I really didn't believe it. And I was persona non grata, they, you know, because I was very outspoken about the fact that I didn't agree with the, the government that, that still is in power. Probably the longest dictatorship, I think, in history so far, I believe, is still, um, I mean, he's dead, but it, they're still there. Um, so that would have been rough for me to actually do that, because I know I would have disappointed and angered a lot of people and hurt a lot of people. But again, I say, if I knew that something that I could have said, but I, I was convinced otherwise. I was convinced that there was nothing that could be said. Um, so I tried to convince other world leaders to open their eyes and try to open their hearts to Cuba. I remember that I caught a lot of flack when we went and met with Mandela. Um, from the Cuban community even, because you know Cubans, oh my gosh, they want to control everybody's thought process, both in and out of Cuba, by the way. It's part of our nature, I don't know where we got it, but it is part of our nature. So, and we have a tough time sharing ideas as the exile community in Miami sometimes has had a tough time doing so. But when I spoke to President Mandela, which was one of the biggest honors of my life, we spoke to him in his home which, by the way, he made his own bed every day at five in the morning and still listened to a little transistor radio and was one of those people that, if you're blessed to meet, it, you're very fortunate. And of course, the only thing he knew of Fidel Castro was the fact that he was a staunch supporter of his during the 30 years that he was in jail. So he had no way of knowing about the truth that was going on in Cuba. So I spoke to him about those things, about how things actually were. And I also understood where he would, you know, have, feel support for Castro because Castro supported him when no one did. We had a tougher time convincing the Cubans of what, in Miami, of what we were trying to do. But that's all I've ever done. Every time that I've gotten the opportunity to speak to a world leader, I tell them, please keep the Cuban people in your hearts and minds, including the Pope, uh, when I uh, sang for him, he invited me to go to Cuba with him, John Paul, in 97. And it was a very hard call because to tell the Pope no when you're a Catholic girl is not an easy thing. <laughs> but he understood, as did the Dalai Lama when he asked me as well, you know, why haven't you gone back? And I expressed to uh, Pope John Paul that his mission was a spiritual one that he was doing, and me getting mixed in with it would turn it political. 
and I could not sit and not express my disagreement with what was going on in Cuba. And I did not want to diminish or mar in any way the spiritual mission that he had by going to Cuba for the Cuban people that needed him very much because religion had been shut down. People could not go to their place of worship because religion, according to the Communist Party, is not allowed. So he understood that. And to the Dalai Lama, I said, if I were to go perform in Cuba, for example, like I've been at when Juan is went, he invited me as well. And I said, I cannot stand on a Cuban stage and sing Oye Mi Canto, talking about freedom of expression, or sing Mi Tierra, knowing that I'm going to leave and those people are going to be left in the same situation, not wanting to express something that would cause violence. So for me as a Cuban, but however, I want people to go. I want people to experience Cuba and to have people from Cuba see and talk to people because they've been stuck. They're on an island. It's a it's very unique situation, and they haven't been able to get out. So now as to your other question, who would I want to speak to? I've been so lucky to speak to so many people. I don't know if there's any one person other than Sigmund Freud that I'd like to get <laughs> a That's handle the psychologist <laughs> on his. <laughs> I've had the opportunity to mm -hmm. speak with six U.S. presidents, the Queen of England, uh, the Prince, Princess Diana, Prince uh, Charles, uh, Mandela, the Dalai Lama, two popes, and be able to speak one-on-one -on -one with them. So I can't ask for more. I'd be pretty greedy <laughs> if I wanted somebody else. Thank you. Thank There's you. somebody on this side of the aisle at the back. You're, you're right there, so the microphone will get to you first. Thank you. I've really enjoyed uh, hearing your remarks. Thank you. Can you um, talk about uh, relate your relationship with Donald Trump, if you had the opportunity to meet with him, especially now, <laughs> with the North Korean situation, what you would tell him? Well, things we don't that you have think a relationship. Good. Okay. <laughs> what do you think he's doing right, or what you think he's doing wrong with the we country? We have precisely oh 30 more seconds okay. left in this program. <laughs> I am no one to judge what right or wrong is until the chips fall where they may. You know, I have a lot of belief in this country, and I am not fearful by any means. I believe in our justice system. I believe in the laws of this country. I believe in the Constitution. And I believe that, you know, uh, this is one of the best countries that you could live in. So, well, I really don't have a relationship. I've met him. He actually, actually the last world tour I announced from Trump Tower, he was standing by my side there. I would have, and this is before Donald Trump, by the way, I wish there was a president school, all right? <laughs> Everyone in this place is preparing for, you know, careers. If you, I think there should be preparation for the number one job in the world. And there should be, if you have aspirations to do that, I think it's wonderful that any man can, but I, th I think personally that if you're going to aspire to that position, I wish there was some, something that you would go through first. Every, whoever wants to try to become president should, I, I wish there was a presidential school or something. Yeah. Because I think we need it. Yes, and I think this has to be the last question, yes. so please keep Gloria, it short. Gloria, thank so you very answer. much. Thank you. I really enjoyed and learned a lot from you. I'm from Iran, a country that shares, unfortunately, lots of political similarity with, um, similarities with Cuba. And um, I grew up watching you despite all the hardships we had getting any video or music um, in the 90s, in the early 80s. Um, but my question is, as a person who has been in the entertainment business for a long time, and as a woman um, in this business, um, what's your reaction, what's your advice um, to all of us younger women, especially at the times that there are lots of movements like the Time's Up movements or hashtag Me Too movements? How do we make sure that um, we are the people as women and we don't need to fight for our rights, we have rights, and um, just 
Tell me I what do. you think. Well, even Thank if you, you have rights, you constantly have to fight for them. Because depending on what's going on, those rights might come under attack or might be threatened by certain you know, things, people in power, whatever. I think it's a wonderful time for women right now because of those movements. Because things have been unearthed. They're coming out into the daylight. Things that have been going on for centuries that were accepted, that were hard to battle against, that were hard to bring to the forefront. So I think that very especially young women now, we need to take that, like I said before, that in my career there was a moment where you have to use the momentum. Momentum is crucial in many times of your life to not waste it, to keep it alive, to become involved. Because I think that one of the toughest things that I see in this country is that involvement is left to the extremes. The silent majority, the people that feel strongly, but sometimes feel that it is such a difficulty, so complicated, so like sometimes not worth the pain, sit out things. And we can't sit it out. We can't sit out the things that matter. We have to, and especially for our young people and our young women, we're seeing more women getting into politics, getting into positions of power. We still have to battle that glass ceiling. We still don't have equal pay for equal work. That's still something that needs to be promoted and worked on uh, and is fair, but somehow, for whatever reason, you need things like this momentum, like the Me Too, like these other things to make it happen. So, you know, like my song, like Get On Your Feet, got to get up and make it happen. It's not going to happen by itself. And I think it's important to instill in our daughters. For example, I see my daughter and she has a completely different, you know, attitude about life. We see it with our young women. They're very empowered in many, many ways. We have to support that and, and continue to help them, give them a hand up in whatever way we can and support each other. You know, women support men and men support women because we have to all support each other. But yeah, momentum is key. And I think we need to keep that going. Thank Anybody you. Else? Uh, thank you. <laughs> on, on behalf of, our, of Vali Nasser, our dean, and all of us, the, the team that was so excited to put this event together for you at SAIS, Thank you for coming. Thank you for sharing your thoughts so generously. And please come back. Oh, my gosh. <laughs>